Hello and welcome to Mary Live. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. My friends in Jesus and Mary, many are asking the question, well, now that the solar eclipse has taken place on April 8th, what now? And in fact, some predicted a rapture, others predicted uh, an illumination of conscience, and still others predicted uh, the end of the world. And of course, we know that none of those things took place. Now, I mention this not to mock those individuals who put forward those ideas, however potentially uh, incorrect or excessive, because at least, at least they had the sense to realize something spiritual is being signed, is being indicated by this total solar eclipse and by its course passing through, once again, many cities or towns, townships named Nineveh coming forward through a Texas town named Jonah, and also an awareness of the need of North America, and in this case, particularly the United States, to repent, to accept the call of Jonah, biblically, to examine ourselves as persons, but also as a country, and to offer repentance. So, even though, in fact, uh, the uh, guesses, the estimates, the uh, predictions, uh, speculations of many uh, did not come forward. Uh, what is very important is to remember if we're going to follow the Jonah Nineveh biblical narrative, which I think merits uh, our focus, then we have to realize that the sign never is simultaneous with chastisement, with justice. Why? Because the purpose of the sign is to give people time to repent, to convert. Obviously, in the case of Nineveh, the prophet Jonah says, you know, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Uh, if God wanted to destroy Nineveh, he wouldn't have Jonah give the sign, give the prophecy, give the message to call. And I believe there's a legitimate parallel with our own country uh, in our present situation. Uh, and so one would I think not appropriately, or at least logically, expect the chastisement, the, the justice, the, the, the kabam, if you will, to happen on the day of the sign. The purpose of the sign is to lead to conversion and repentance. And so 40 days from April 8th is also the eve of Pentecost. Uh, perhaps further significance in those 40 days and what that portends for our country. Now, two things of great significance did happen on April 8th. One I think very valuable, the other I believe to be tragic. Let's speak about the valuable event first. The dicastery for the doctrine of faith that Vatican Commission in charge of the church's doctrine and overseeing sound doctrine came out with a document called uh, Dignitas Infinita, uh, Infinite Dignity. And it's interesting that it was uh, approved uh, on March 25th uh, and it's promulgated, uh, which is typically the Feast of the Annunciation, as you know, the Solemnity, but it was promulgated on April 8th, which is only for this year uh, and odd years when March 25th lands uh, during Holy Week and, and with this particular uh, calendar cycle. So April 8th was, of course, the Annunciation. So uh, that's a double uh, annunciation significance, potentially, liturgically. What did the document say? I want to highlight three elements of the document. And uh, I thank uh, our viewers who, who asked me if I would highlight this. Uh, I do pray and, and hope and try to have Mary Live also be a, when appropriate, a weekly commentary on things that are pertinent uh, to the church and the world, but God willing, through the eyes of Our Lady and through the heart uh, of Our Lady. So uh, I'm very happy to at least give a, a, a basic summary of what the Vatican document uh, released and discusses. Uh, I'm going to, because of its length, it's a 20-page document, I'm going to talk about three elements that are in the latter section, which speak about, you know, issues uh, that are particularly pertinent to today. So uh, the first is abortion. And in this document, uh, which is written by Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, the prefect for the dicastery, with the approval of uh, 
of our Holy Father, Pope Francis. It quotes St. John Paul II in one of the, uh, I think, most insightful uh, papal statements on abortion. So I want to read that to you. Bear with me here just briefly. Again, St. John Paul II, quote, Among all the crimes which can be committed against life, procured abortion has characteristics making it particularly serious and deplorable. But today, in many people's consciences, the perception of its gravity has become progressively obscured. The acceptance of abortion in the popular mind, in behavior, and even in law itself is a telling sign of an extremely dangerous crisis of the moral sense, which is becoming more and more incapable of distinguishing between good and evil, even when the fundamental right to life is at stake. Given such a grave situation, we need now more than ever to have the courage to look the truth in the eye and to call things by their proper name without yielding to convenient compromises or to the temptation of self-deception. In this regard, the reproach of the prophet uh, is extremely straightforward. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, Isaiah 5.20. Especially in the case of abortion, there is a widespread use of ambiguous terminology, such as, quote, interruption of pregnancy, which tends to hide abortion's true nature and to, uh, and to accentuate its seriousness in public opinion. Perhaps this linguistic phenomenon is itself a symptom of an, an, of an uneasiness of conscience. But no word has the power to change the reality of things. Procured abortion is the deliberate and direct killing by whatever means it is carried out of a human being in the initial phase of his or her existence extending from conception to birth. What is Pope St. John Paul II uh, telling us in no uncertain terms? <coughs> you mean the absolute unconditional evil of abortion, but also the new ambiguity uh, that perhaps, perhaps comes forward from conscience is guilty uh, in reference to abortion. So what does that mean practically? That means every time you hear the expression reproductive health, rights, substitute killing innocent babies. When you hear about a woman's right to choose, just take that out and put in killing innocent babies. And also, when you're talking about a woman's right over her own body, take that out because that's not looking the truth in the eye. Embryology has told us that you know, 50 years ago, this is not part of the woman's body. It has a separate DNA. Uh, you know the list of, of reasons why. Even in science, it's not considered the woman's part of the woman's body. So let's look at the truth in the eye. Abortion is killing unborn babies. And in that sense, it has a, a certain ferocity. It has a certain um, evil because it's attacking the most innocent. So this continues in widespread case in our country. Uh, and I'll mention more in just a moment because we have a new tragic dimension of abortion that has also been promulgated on April 8th. But let's go back to this document. I want to also make reference to the Holy Fathers and the, and the congregation's teaching on surrogate motherhood. So the Holy Father, uh, again, confirms, and he's quoted in his document uh, regarding these elements as well as previous documents, uh, Tutti Fratelli, um, social encyclical, that surrogate motherhood can never be permitted, that surrogate motherhood is in itself a rejection of the dignity of the mother and the dignity of the child. Uh, in Italy, it has the tragic name of, um, of uh, in, in, inefito. It's called utero inefito, which, which literally means uh, a womb or uterus for rent. Uh, and, and that bespeaks, <coughs> that bespeaks the, the terrible um, violation of dignity 
And so this document will say very clearly that surrogate motherhood can never be justified. Uh, and let me mention, just for the sake of why these documents are so important, we get this clarity. Some would say, well, who would even think about that? Many, many years ago, I had a, a, a very good student, a, a, a young woman, who came up after class and said, Dr. Miravalli, my sister and her husband are not able to conceive in this first year or two. And so they asked me to help them by being a surrogate mother. And I'm pro-life, and I certainly want to help them. Is there anything wrong with that? Well, of course, there's something very serious, seriously wrong with that because it's separating the procreative from the unitive uh, goals of sexuality in marriage. But my point is, this was a very good young Christian woman who just thought it was pro-life to help. That's why when the Vatican gives us these directives, it's so important that we make them our own and we're able to articulate them. Uh, that's why the Holy Father says, and again, this document quotes, that surrogacy uh, denies the woman dignity because she's being used as a commodity, as a, as a, as a renta womb, to use a, really a vile expression. But the child also enters life through an artificial means, not a human means. And so these are grossly inappropriate. However, the good intentions might be to be pro-life. Uh, I want to now hit, it's also so, so extremely important and so relevant uh, when we talked about this in our last Mary Live, the issue of gender theory and uh, elements of uh, transgenderism and uh, sex change. Now, he starts, uh, the document starts, this is number 55, and bear with me, I just want to read this, so I want you to hear the words from the document so you can confidently uh, quote the church in making these wonderfully clear moral distinctions between good and evil. Remember the quote of St. John Paul II? He said, that's what we're losing. We're losing our ability, uh, which is the, the basic tenet of natural law, to, to do good and to avoid evil. This ambiguity, abortion is undermining fundamental human rights, which will not be limited to the unborn child. Mother Teresa's classic statement at the prayer breakfast, if you kill a baby in the womb, then no one on the street is safe. We'll get back to Mother Teresa in just a few moments. The document says, quote, this number 55, the church wishes, first of all, to reaffirm that every person, regardless of sexual orientation, ought to be respected in his or her dignity and treated with consideration, while every sign of unjust discrimination is to be carefully avoided, particularly any form of aggression and violence. Uh, for this reason, it should, be it should be denounced as contrary to human dignity the fact that in some places not a few people are imprisoned, tortured, or even deprived of the good of life solely because of their sexual orientation. So we've got to land on this first. This is part of the church's teaching because it's part of the heart of Christ. We can't see someone as less than human because they have a sexual orientation that may, in fact, be disordered. It may be wrong directed, uh, which in most cases has nothing to do with their will. And so that's why there can't be discrimination, lack of love, lack of respect for anyone who poses to have a same-sex attraction. That's how it starts, and it's important it starts there. It then goes on to say, talk about gender theory. And remember, gender theory in general is the theory that, A, you can determine your own gender. Now, gender in itself is a loaded word. Gender is a word that came out of the late 60s and early 70s as if you could really have a complete uh, distinction, difference, between your biological sex and your gender. That's, that's where the problem arised. Uh, so listen to what, uh, again, this document says. Uh, regarding gender theory, whose scientific coherence is the subject of considerable debate among experts, the church recalls that human life in all its dimensions, both physical and spiritual, is a gift from God. The gift is to be accepted with gratitude and placed at the service of the good. And here's the, the zinger line. Desiring a personal self-determination as gender theory prescribes 
apart from this fundamental truth that human life is a gift, amounts to a concession to the age-old temptation to make oneself God. Entering into competition with the true God of love revealed to us in the gospel. So, this document with no uncertain terms is saying, we play God when we try to change our gender, which is really changing our biological sex. Remember, my friends, changing the exterior has no effect on the interior, on the soul, on part of God's uniqueness given to every human being, whether they are male or female. That's part of that gift. The document goes on to say that uh, the difference between male and femaleness is the greatest difference of human persons, which leads to the greatest complementarity of man and woman, and also leads to the miracle of new life. And so those all come and go together. If you take away the differences of male and female uh, and the complementarity of male and female, you take away procreation. Uh, there was one, uh, again, tragic series of, uh, of uh, medical uh, experiments going on in Oregon uh, at a certain university, medical institute, and they said, we can really get a human being, uh, a baby from two men. Uh, but if you read the reference, uh, which of course is ridiculous, you read the reference, it's talking about taking a woman's ovum and cleaning it out and using the shell and then taking some of one male's DNA and then uniting it with the sperm of another. Uh, these things are even uh, almost obscene to talk about. Of course, you can't have a baby with a man and a man or a woman and a woman. This is where we're getting, we're, we're hesitant to say man is different than woman and it's a beautiful complementarity and only with that complementarity do we have children. Can we see the overall attack on the tree of life? Does this not bring us back to Genesis where God puts an angel with a flaming sword to protect the tree of life? Doesn't it incorporate Fatima, the third secret of Fatima, where uh, there is a, a an angel with a flaming sword uh, saying penance, 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 and Our Lady is putting out the flames. Why? Because we're attacking the tree of life like never before in history through a untold arrogance. When the document says playing God, that's not an exaggeration. We, we're, we're telling God we can start life, we think, with cloning. We can end life we think with abortion, with euthanasia, with assisted suicide, uh, and we can futzy with life, with men and women, and, and how babies arrange, and even gender, throughout the whole process. This is playing God, it's offensive to God, and there's a price to be paid for it. I'm not saying that in fear-mongering, I'm simply saying, again, remember, justice is a virtue, and God always prefers mercy, always, always, but if we don't respond, if we keep rejecting him in, in, in such a belligerent fashion as a, as a human race, we should expect justice because we're not accepting the mercy. Now, uh, the document also says, before we leave it, um, regarding sex changes, uh, that again, based on this gender theory where one can simply medically uh, change one's exterior organs, which has absolutely no impact on, on the interior, that, of course, sex changes are also uh, reprehensible. They cannot be acceptable. Uh, and so uh, the document says, this is number 60, it follows that any sex change intervention as a rule risks threatening the unique dignity the person has received from the moment of conception. This is not to exclude the possibility that a person with genital abnormalities that are already evident at birth or that developed later may choose to receive the assistance of healthcare professionals. Uh, what's the last line? Yeah, well, there are, you know, C.S. Lewis says uh, some people are born colorblind. Uh, he uses his own example of his, uh, dis he doesn't, he's not prone to children, he, but he said, that, that's my abnormality. That's not part of humanity. So, in occasions, uh, which deserves compassion and oftentimes medical treatment, uh, 
a child, a baby can be born without the appropriate external genitalia uh, in, in proper form with their sex. So of course, that surgery can be morally permitted, but not the idea that I'm not special, I'm not accepted among my peers, I have to stand out some way, I'm existentially hurting, and the only way to solve that is to go through a sex change. It's not love, once again, it's not love to confirm that error. So thanks be to God for a very clear document on these current issues uh, by the Dicastery for the Doctrine of Faith and uh, the approval of our Holy Father. So that's the good thing that happened on April 8th. What's the tragic thing? And I want to preface this by saying, uh, and I say this from my mind and heart, I'm not making now a political statement. I'm making a moral social statement. Nor would I want these words to in any way encourage uh, the support of a candidate that has as, we're talking about presidential candidates here, that has as his, his whole modus operandi, spreading as much abortion and uh, LGBTQ confusion and sex changes and everything <laughs> that this document says you can't do uh, in our country. But I would not be honest uh, if I did not also report, speak about, uh, what I consider to be a tragic announcement on April 8th when one presidential candidate who has had such pro-life victories, such heroic pro-life victories, came out and stated his position on abortion saying, A, that everyone must follow their heart regarding abortion, and B, that this candidate's uh, position on abortion is now that he will leave it, if elected, he will leave it to states to individually decide. I consider that personally to be a tragedy. Let's take the first line, that we have to follow our hearts. Well, look, if, going back to St. John Paul II, if we're talking about killing innocent, unborn babies, that's what abortion is, then how can we want to encourage people to follow their hearts we don't allow, encourage, sustain, support anybody following their hearts in killing anybody else, killing a, a former spouse or a disgruntled uh, em employer or follow your heart. That doesn't reflect God's law. That doesn't reflect what this country is based on. God and faith and family. So that... Uh, I see as a as a tragic change of position, and and also by deduction, uh, this would mean that there would not be a support for a national ban on abortion. So what we're saying, and let's get rid of all the jargon. We're saying that we as a country don't want to stop killing kids in the womb. What used to be the safest place in all human existence is now the most dangerous place, the womb of a mother. And so this cannot be seen as an advancement. This is a very serious regression because it means that the many states uh, who are pro-abortion uh, will remain pro-abortion. So, and let's remember, we uh, legislate all types of moralities federally. And to say that we can't have a federal uh, either amendment or law that restricts the killing of unborn babies or eliminates it entirely, is a sad day. It's a sad moment. Um, one uh, interesting uh, byline, headline, which is a little bit uh, uh, comical, circle said, uh, unborn babies are searching for a third candidate. Um, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chase this with what I started. I would never, ever want any of my comments to lead someone to support a candidate that is so pro-abortion, so pro-LGBTQ, so pro-everything that's against Judeo-Christian morals. Quite frankly, I can't imagine how a serious, dedicated Christian could vote for such a platform. But in, in frankness and transparency, I, I have to also express that April 8th brought, I think, a, a tragic uh, compromise. 
And remember, again, the words of St. John Paul II, we're entering ambiguity and compromise. And this is not pleasing to God. So all of this leads for a call of conversion. And again, I, I believe we may be in a specified time when we can show to God that we do want to repent. We do want to make our country to return, if you will, to its founding elements. I, I, I must share this with you. Uh, back in 1993, I had a few days down in Calcutta with Mother uh, Teresa, uh, who was, by the way, a very strong advocate for the Fifth Marian Dogma. I'll mention that also in a few moments. Uh, and in uh, two days down there, she asked me to give seven presentations supporting the solemn proclamation of Our Lady as the spiritual mother of all humanity, including her three roles as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. Well, as we were going from one place to another, we were actually stopped in the middle of Calcutta because there, were, there was a crossing of cows. And I was in a, a little jeep uh, with mother and three other sisters. The other sisters uh, heard this as well. So I said, look, I'm, I'm next to this living saint. I've got to ask her something. Uh, we had a three-hour ride together just getting from one place to another. And I said, so mother, what would it take to stop abortion in the United States? And I tell you, mother did not hesitate an iota. She said, if every parish did three hours of Eucharistic adoration every day, abortion would be completely eliminated in your country. Now, that's from now St. Teresa of Calcutta, three hours of Eucharistic adoration. Uh, what a wonderful challenge. Uh, and that's one way we can address abortion very specifically. And, you know, there's a fascinating similarity between our Eucharistic Jesus and our, our unborn children. And that is, they're absolutely real and true, but we can't see them fully. The unborn baby is hidden in the womb. Jesus is, quote, hidden under the accidents of bread and wine. But he's really there. So is the unborn kid. Really there. And so adoration. But in general, how do we respond? How do we seek to respond to even, you know, what could in fact be a sign of a solar eclipse uh, calling us to conversion? By the way, before World War I in 1914, there was a solar eclipse that was over Europe. In 1939, before World War II, there was a solar eclipse uh, over Europe. Then months later, you had the beginning in World War I and the more definitive beginning in World War II of uh, these two tragic wars. Uh, God does use nature to tell us things. God does use signs in the skies. Uh, we know even in the Fatima message, uh, Sister Lucia on July 13th, 1917, in the great Fatima message, speaking about a conditional Second World War, uh, the message says, Our Lady says, when you see a light, a night, excuse me, a night illuminated by an unknown light, you will know that these things are soon to pass. Well, in fact, what was predicted was a conditional Second World War. Uh, and on January 26, 1938, there was a massive Aurora Borealis, which Sister Lucia identified as that sign, and months later, the Second World War. So, the point is, solar eclipses as a warning, as an indication of future challenge, purification, chastisement, is simply not unprecedented. So what do we do? We go back to our spiritual basics. Number one, the Eucharist. Remember that great uh, dream of Don Bosco, the Eucharist and the Mother. Get yourself situated between those two pillars. What specifically with the Eucharist? Well, if you can go to daily Mass, Make new efforts to go to daily Mass. Receive what is the gift of the day for the faithful, as Our Lady said in her apparitions that I believe to be authentic in Medjugorje. Uh, at least weekly adoration. At least spend one hour adoring our sweet Jesus, who waits, in, in a real sacramental sense, for us to come to him. Isn't that something? Having a private audience with the Holy Father is a great thing. I've had about 25 of them. It's a, it's a real blessing. But going to, to the Blessed Sacrament is is having a private audience with the person that the Pope is vicar of, Jesus Christ himself. And the irony is he's waiting for us to show. So try to get at least a week of adoration in. Then, of course, consistent confession. Uh, at least once a month, 
I myself try to go once a week. I find if, if I haven't gone by day nine or 10, I feel like uh, I am compromised uh, in terms of battling uh, my thorns in the flesh, my sins. So, but at least a monthly confession. And then prayers of Our Lady. We all know the rosary has changed the course of history. We know that. We know it at Lepanto. We know it at Vienna. Uh, we know it even in the Philippines uh, with the great uh, Marcos uh, battle uh, of, of, of a threat of really firing on a million uh, civilians praying the rosary in the principal square in Manila. And uh, Cardinal Sin testified that many said they saw the silhouette of Our Lady that prevented that happening because of the rosary. So the power of the rosary, daily praying the rosary for, for the conversion of our country and also for peace in the world. Also, I have to include the prayer of the Lady of All Nations. Here we go again. All right, there we are. That's the prayer on the back. No, that's the image, of course. On the back is the prayer. My friends, I, I really, I have no hesitancy to beg you in Our Lady's name to pray this prayer daily and to spread it. It is such a beautiful prayer. And for our more frequent uh, viewers, this is nothing new, but for newer listeners I, I wanna, and viewers, I, I want to emphasize this. This is a prayer uh, that I believe, believe was given especially for this time. Why? It's a prayer asking Jesus to send the Holy Spirit into the hearts of all nations to prevent degeneration, disasters, and war. That's what's facing us right now. So it is a prayer that holds a very powerful place before the throne of God. Again, I, I beg you in Our Lady's name, uh, pray this prayer daily. It takes about 25 or 30 seconds. Um, and you can get the prayer. Uh, you can go to motherofallpeoples.com. If you want the prayer card in English or in Spanish, we'll send, send it out to you uh, uh, free of charge. If you can send a donation, fine. But if it makes you hesitate one iota, forget it. We'll get it to you. You want 5, 10, 50, 100 for your parish? We'll send that to you free of charge. Uh, just go to Mother of All People, scroll to the bottom, uh, and put in your name and address, how many prayer cards you want. Uh, we have to be invoking our Lord for a new descent of the Holy Spirit through Our Lady's intercession. Once again, 40 days from April 28th uh, prepares us for Pentecost. But overall, we need a new Pentecost in the church in the world today. We need a new descent of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to do this on our own. That just takes a minimum of humility for us to grant. We're not going to get out of the present global and even crisis in the church without the intercession of heaven. And again, I want to relay what Our Lady says at Fatima, where she says on that July 13th, 1917 uh, message, she alone can help you from the calamities that approach. She says the identical thing, almost verbatim, in Akita, the Church Approved Apparitions, October 13th, 1973, I alone am able, am able to save you from the calamities that approach. What's in the middle? The reported Amsterdam apparitions, from which we get this prayer, which is completely approved by the local bishop, completely approved by the Vatican. It's a completely approved prayer. The apparitions, the reported apparitions, call for the proclamation of a fifth Marian dogma. Now, let me address this very basically and, and briefly here. And again, M Mother Teresa uh, was so strong on this proclamation, she basically said that only, well, to quote her, more, more specifically, Mother speaks about how Mary is co-redemptrix, she's mediatrix, she's advocate, and that a papal proclamation would bring great graces to the church. Okay. So I want to focus on that. Don't think of the proclamation of the Fifth Marian Dogma as just a nice theological ivory tower completion. It's all about grace. We need grace. We need heavenly help. Mary's the mediatrix of all graces. The Holy Spirit chooses to act only through her, St. Maximilian Kolbe tells us. St. John Paul II tells us that at Calvary, she spiritually crucified with her crucified son, and her role as co-redemptrix doesn't stop at Calvary. Well, why doesn't it stop there? She working as the new Eve with the new Adam to obtain the grace, because then the grace has to be distributed to human hearts and especially today. So 
Why such an, a, a focus? Why so much emphasis on a fifth Marian dogma? Because it will bring a historic release of grace because God wants his mother honored this way. This is not a human invention. It's a, it's a Trinitarian desire that we would acknowledge the role of the Immaculate Co-Redemptrix, who then is given the task as mother to distribute the graces to humanity and to advocate for us. And that's what this prayer says. Uh, at the end, may the, may the Lady of All Nations, the Blessed Virgin Mary, be our advocate. We need an advocate. And so, again, pray this prayer, because that prayer is the prayer that will, in a special way, prepare for the proclamation of the Fifth Marian Dogma. And those reported apparitions, and again, we're in total obedience to the December 30th, 2020 statement by the new bishop, taking them after 18 years of being complete, completely approved and spread throughout the world to now being uh, in the middle category of reported, non constat, uh, not constat de non, not condemned, but not approved, not condemned. But the, the reported message says that only with this proclamation will peace enter the world. So what does this have to do with the solar eclipse? What does it have to do with these issues of abortion and, and uh, surrogacy and uh, transgender? The answer is everything, because grace solves everything. When humans cooperate with the grace of God, then we have something called the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That's why, once again, please get this prayer. We'll send it to you free of charge. Uh, spread the prayer. Pray the prayer daily. And let's end by praying this prayer so that both for the conversion of our country, which I think is in a critical time, uh, we can receive mercy instead of justice, but also on the global scene that we can have a spiritual remedy for the degeneration, disasters, and war that we are facing in unprecedented dimensions. So let us pray together the prayer of the Lady of All Nations. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disasters, and war. May the Lady of all nations, the Blessed Virgin Mary, be our advocate. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us. God bless you all.